Funding for this program was made possible in part by and by Holtzman Oil for friendly and courteous delivery of heating oil and kerosene. We serve residential, commercial, and agricultural customers with competitive pricing, efficient delivery service, and friendly, knowledgeable staff to help when you call. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows. American Masters. Antiques Roadshow. Nature. Nova. Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today. You can never trust anybody but your guy next to you. That's why we are all brothers. But let me talk a little bit about Vietnam, the things that people don't talk about. First of all, I'm old. I was old when I went. It takes a while to get through medical school. No one knew why we were there until you talked to enough people and looked around. And you hear things like, oh, we're here because they produce six crops of rice in the Mekong Delta every year, and we're going to starve the Chinese out by blocking their rice supply. Isn't going to happen. It was all politics. Um, Ho Chi Minh came back from Paris, stirred up the multitudes, and after the French got wiped out on Highway 1 in 1958, um, the North Vietnamese communists started moving down. Again, the not too bright politicians, you know, people can go where they want to go, the democratic mind. Uh, you want to go south, you go south. You want to go north, you go north. Nobody went north, but the north came south. And they got into the villages and they began to really intimidate the people. Um, I treated a little girl there that had a bullet hole right through her wrist where they shot her for effect. Uh, they were very cruel people. In 1958, the French left Indochina, Vietnam, and uh, the communists started moving in. A doctor, Tom Dooley, told them what was happening, and they wouldn't listen. Oh, yeah, but what do you know? You're just a dumb doctor, a missionary doctor. And it took them two years to get their head out of where the sun doesn't shine and say, hey, we've got to do something about this. All of a sudden, we're sending uh, advisory troops over, mostly special forces. And we're sending them over there to, to train the uh, Vietnamese uh, how to fight this problem. After five years, uh, they, committed, they started committing troops. Because the situation was out of control, the communists owned the jungle. And in Vietnam, you owned only what you physically stood on, and then sometimes that was questionable. So it just escalated. And this again is my unofficial opinion. Generals should run wars. Politicians have no place in war. I had problems <clears throat> when I came back. I lost my wife, lost my, uh, a lot of friends. Because I, you know, when you come back from a war and people don't like you, you know, we weren't allowed to wear our uniforms on the planes and stuff. Once we left the base, we had to look like civilians because people would throw things, they'd spit. You know, I never got spat on, but, 
you know, the stories are true because they would do that. And it was a time of the TV, it's the first time they ever had television in a war. And of course the TV, like today, is for sensationalism. They want to know, they want to be there, they want to see the firefight, they want to do, and they tell you the wrong information back then. Once in a while on TV, that says that we lost Tech in 1968, and we did not lose Tech. We had, a, you know, there were casualties, of course, but nothing like he had broadcasted. When I was up Quang Tree Province, Ho Chi Minh Trail came right over from Cambodia and went on down to the southern part of the country. They wanted to get to Saigon. But we knew they were running. When, when Johnson stopped the bombing, they came over those hills like ants, and it was a free road to them. There was too many of them for us to stop. You could, you know, you could deter them, but uh, they were definitely invading. The North Viet Vietnam soldiers were invading. But I worked with the son of the uh, vice president of South Vietnam. His last name was Nguyen, and he was an engineer. Of course, we were doing research and development and weapons. So we got to talking one day, and he said if we would have bombed two more weeks, the North Vietnam was uh, ready to surrender. And we stopped the bombing, and it was like giving a hummingbird sugar water. They just came. So. The worst thing after being in the mud and all that went on over there, coming home was the worst. I got off. I got off the plane. I I was uh, left uh, Da Nang. We we went from. I flew from a Huey from up north to on a Huey to when I got discharged or got out of came home. Uh, to Da Nang, got on a plane to Da Nang. They flew us to uh, Long Beach, California. That was my discharge station. When I left Long Beach for California on a bus, that was the longest ride that I'll ever, ever remember. The way the people treated you. Uh, I went from there to LAX, which is Los Angeles International Airport. Went through the airport, and some of the guys, I didn't know afterwards, but some of them weren't allowed to wear the uniforms home. But me, I, I didn't, I didn't. I wore mine, but, but nobody told me I didn't have to. So I wore mine, I even asked my wife the other day, I said, did I wear my uniform home or not? She said, yes, you did. But I, uh, that ride, it was a long one. But I got on the plane, and when I, when I got off the bus to go into the airport to get on the plane, there was hippies there spitting, cussing, calling you baby killer. It was, I, I had no idea what I was, what I was coming home to. Uh, it was, it was a mess. I got on the plane, I got home, and my sweetheart back there, she met me at the plane, her and my mom. And I never was so glad to see friendly faces in all my life. I don't know, it's just so different when you come home, all these demonstrations, these cry babies running around, and compared now, they're walking soldiers home. That's the best thing that could ever be done. I've been to a couple of them myself. See these young kids, 18, 19, those small six-year-old fart, walk them home, you know. <laughs> it's really great. But a lot has changed between then and now. Really have. As far as my thoughts on Vietnam, uh, being there when I enlisted, I, I, I believe that you know we were uh, fighting communism. Uh, I was going to fight for my country, uh, so I enlisted uh, because my father and on down had uh, fought in World War II and other wars. So 
I was just going to uh, continue that legacy. But after being there a while, uh, you could see that the Vietnamese people didn't want us there and they didn't want the North there. And uh, my ideas changed a little bit on why we really were there. So uh, in the end, we were really fighting for each other and we were fighting for survival. Uh, now, I, you know, I, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I fought for my country. Uh, sometimes I think how it would be if uh, if I hadn't went, uh, would it be like to grow up as a 19-year-old kid, you know, normal? But uh, when you're over, there, when you 19, just turn 19, and you're thrust into a war like Vietnam was, uh, you you turn old quick, and and I turned older before, you know, my time. I, I think we were hesitating to like the guys. Uh, the general feeling wasn't positive. <clears throat> so you just didn't broadcast it unless you were with your own guys, with the women or the fellows. What did, what did we do? Kept to ourselves, I guess. <laughs> um, wrote a lot. Reconnected uh, with the guys if we could. Um, war is a funny thing. Well, not a funny thing, but it, uh, it gives a person pause to think of what might have been. And uh, sometimes it's just not good to go there, so you just take one step ahead of the other and go on to your next um, adventure. The, the the trip home is, is quite an experience. Yeah, uh, first on the trip out, they they told us at McCord Air Force Base that that the train plane was landing and they wanted a quick turnaround, so be ready. And so the the uh, veterans returning to the U.S. and the newbies, the the new guys going out, walk by two lines of each other. And that experience, the veterans came in with ragged you know, mustaches, long hair, uh, uniforms that looked like they were worn out, dirty, and we were brand new uniforms. You know, we just stared at each other, no expression or anything else, but that's something I'll remember. And then coming out, we had the other experience. We left Benoit Air Force Base. Um, there was no emotion on the flight that was showed, uh, shown by anyone except when we lifted off from Benoit, a cheer went up from the entire plane. Um, when we, we landed in Hawaii and refueled and the plane had some problems, and that, we weren't in the United States yet as far as the, the passengers were concerned. But then as uh, a little later on as in the flight, the pilot came on and said, gentlemen, what you see ahead of you are the lights of San Francisco and another roar went up from the plane. I guess to most of the plane, that was the real United States. Unreal. I was over there, I missed all the demonstrations and all, I was overseas. And when I came home, well, I walked through the airport in Frisco, I got spit on when I came home. So, and then when I got back to the valley, you know, everything was just calm and peaceful. They had no clue at all. You go do you, do, you do what you're told to do, and that's all you can do. You follow orders. And I don't think they really realized everything that was going on over there. I had a soldier who was assigned to me as a chaplain's assistant. Bill Anderson was a neat guy, just a neat, neat young man. He's from Georgia. Um, and he begged me because his, his job was supposed to be to protect me. Um, uh, since I wasn't allowed to carry a weapon, as a chaplain I'm not supposed to, I knew how to use them all. And if I went out with the soldiers, I didn't carry one, but I knew that if it got bad enough, and, and my shooting depended on protecting the guys that there would be weapons lying around that I could use. 
But anyway, Bill Anderson begged me, he said, please let me go out with the real soldiers. And I finally I said, okay, Andy, you, I'll let you, I'll assign you, I'll get you in a patrol and you can go out for your 20 days. And you know, he came, <laughs> bless his heart, he came back and he was so excited. He said, man, it was so boring. Oh, boring, boring. It was the last day of that 20 day patrol that they finally had some action that they ran into a, a group of NVAs and they had a, a, a firefight. But you stop and think about it now, see, for 20 days, of those 20 days, he never fired his rifle. See? But the news was reporting, oh, there's fighting every day. Yes, there was fighting every day, but it, it, it was all over the place. It wasn't like total warfare, see? Well, that's not good reporting. See, that's not honest. To me, that's bias. That's saying that the war is, oh, huge war going on. Baloney. Infantry soldiers always take the notion that um, their duty is 12 hours of sheer boredom punctuated by two minutes of utter chaos. When I got back, you know, walked into the airport, here was, here was all these people, you know, yelling and, you know, stuff about, about the GIs. And, you know, I was, I don't know, about the middle of the aircraft, so, you know, there was a lot of guys in front of me. You know, it's like, oh, I can slide out this way. I kind of slid out around everybody and got over to the, to the bathroom there and, you know, changed clothes real quick and snuck on out the back door. You know, and then it was, okay, what do I do now? Well, I chose to stay in the Army. Smartest thing I ever did. You know, the Army took care of me. You know, had a job, had three squares, you know, worked out good. Well, uh, I got on the plane in Benoit Air Base and they were mortaring the field, so that was not good. They were, and of course the steward and I get very nervous if they're taking you off. I will tell you this is probably a universal thing you'd get if you asked the same question. Everybody knows what they do. They go to the north, the planes go to the north a little bit, and then they turn and go out into the Pacific. The plane was absolutely silent until the minute we hit the coast and they could see blue water, and then the plane burst into applause because every last person on that plane knew we'd cleared it where they couldn't shoot you down. So uh, reverential treatment. And I got back to San Francisco through uh, Hawaii and uh, had my uh, khaki uniform on and the stuff they make you wear when you uh, go home. And at San Francisco airport there were demonstrators right in the airport uh, going up to where the planes uh, booked for Atlanta and other spots and they would use the term baby killers and uh, assorted other things. They would also throw stuff at you, and the one that's usually legendary that, say, that said it's mythological is that they would spit on you, but that's true too. So you had to come back to the United States and ask yourself a question. Um, am I gonna be well received in this situation? And the answer for me was uh, probably individually, if you ask this question, it might be a little bit different, but that was not true. I was, when I came back, and that's a, too long a story, um, I was able to change into civilian clothes, so uh, I didn't have the problem walking through the airports uh, that many of them had. Um, also, when I got uh, 
back to uh, Newark Airport when I flew in there. Uh, it was probably one o'clock in the morning, so um, I didn't see anybody at the time. But I know of a lot of others that uh, they went through hell. And uh, that's turned a lot of people away. I figure if I made, I could talk, to, talk them into letting me go for E4, third class petty officer in August. They have several different, what they call inclements, uh, when they pa um, pass you. So I figured, you know, I would, uh, if I made it on the first inclement, which was October 16th, I would come out as a third class petty officer on October, on November 3rd. Okay. They, they said, okay. So I went and took the test. And after I took the test until the time I found out that you know, I was past it, they asked me if I wanted an early out, convenience of the government. I said, yep. Ain't the language I use, but I said, yes, give it to me. I got a 29 day early out. I got out six days before I was supposed to serve on the crow. Before I, was, before I was supposed to make E4. That's the only thing, thing that got me back in reserves. I was passing that E4 test. Okay. It all worked out. Now it is, at the time, I was glad to get the heck out of the, out of the Navy. I don't say I had bitter, bitter feelings about it. I just didn't. I just got tired of putting up with their BS. San Francisco was a tough town. I had lived there a bit as a civilian, but I only had a green uniform to wear, an Army uniform, uh, and I wasn't welcome in a lot of places. I, I uh, uh, met m my former IBM roommate. Uh, we we're going to go to dinner. He wanted to stop and pick up his sister, who was at a coffee house. Uh, I stepped into this coffee house and every head turned to me, all conversation stopped, and uh, my friend said, you better, you better leave. And uh, so, gee, I, I hadn't done anything. On the way home, I should add, we stopped in Okinawa, and at the airport, uh, we were unloading, all of us were going into the terminal, and there were American civilians there who called us baby killers, you know, were shouting baby killers at us. Uh, I don't think anybody on the plane had killed a baby. Uh, we were trying to do our job, so uh, uh, our duty is we saw it. We try to make as much of an effort as we can, the Vietnam veterans, that other veterans today don't get treated the way that we did. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because one of the little sayings that they, they had back then and, and of which I still hear it here and there all the time is, is that uh, speaking for the Vietnam veterans, we loved our country when they didn't love us. And, it, uh, and that's just the way it was. I mean, when I got out, uh, we, they processed me out in California. Uh, we come out of the, the building, we got pelted with, with rotten eggs, rotten vegetables, you name it. We were in our class A's. We had to be in our class A's to get military standby travel. Um, and, and, you know, with all these people, you, you know, you just, you've just done everything that you can to try to make this world a better place, and that's how you get treated for it. Um, we cleaned up the best we could. We got to the airport. Uh, we went up, we had a good meal, and, and we had an elderly couple that came over and paid, there was, I think there were uh, 10 of us, 10 or 12 of us, and they paid for everybody's meal. So you've got from one extreme to the other, you know. Uh, there were a lot of grateful people, but you didn't hear much from them. You didn't hear about them. So uh, today we try to make sure that, that you know, the, the returning veterans, you know, uh, get the recognition and, and get treated the right way, way that they should when they return. We've been doing it for a while, and when people ask, how long have you been out on that bridge? I just say, not long enough. Uh, because there still aren't that many flags that are being waved. Funding for this program was made possible in part by and by
Holtzman Propane is a full-service propane retailer combining competitive pricing with excellent service. Serving residential, commercial, and agricultural markets, Holtzman Propane offers 24-hour repair service, gas line and appliance installation, and automatic meter deliveries. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows. American Masters. Antiques Roadshow. Nature. Nova. Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today.